Mm -hmm. Okay, we are in progress. Entonces, comenzamos, ¿no? Eh, voy a comenzar en español. Eh, los invito a ver este foro. Lo vamos a hacer en inglés. Eh, y los invito a que lean eh, los subtítulos que van a estar eh, puestos próximamente. So, I'll start it off. Welcome, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Hello. <laughs> My name is Oscar Schlenker. I'm a journalist here in Caracas and the president of an NGO called Consorcio Desarrollo y Justicia. I'll be moderating today's meeting and it's a great honor uh, for Quiteria to ask me to do this because we have had many conversations about gay rights in Venezuela and what examples in other countries could be applied to our own experience. So thank you to Stop VIH for conducting this forum as well as Unión Afirmativa also for participating and the Human Rights Campaign for joining us. It's a great honor, uh, especially because it's complex in Venezuela to talk about LGBTQ rights because there are many human rights issues that day-to-day -day Venezuelans have to endure. And sometimes the LGBTQ plus agenda is pushed to the side or divides the already polarized and fragile community we have in Venezuela. But examples like the Bosch talk decision uh, are really important to motivate and create incentives here at home in order to further the agenda that allows LGBTQ plus people to demand more rights, more freedoms and uh, respect in Venezuela. Now the Bostock decision briefly put is a federal decision that came into effect almost two years ago after Clayton County in Atlanta, Georgia fired Gerald Bostock uh, after participating in a gay softball league. Um, the decision used Title VII of the Civil Rights uh, Act of 1964 to rule on the case of Bostock uh, versus Clayton County. And writing for the six over three majority, Justice Gorsuch held that, and I'm gonna read this, uh, an, employer, an employer who fires an individual for being homosexual or transgender fires that person for traits or actions it would not have questioned in members of a different sex. So sex plays a necessary and undisguisable role in the decision, exactly what Title VII forbids. So uh, the Bostock decision uh, has become a landmark civil rights case for the US LGBTQ plus community because the decision extended protections uh, under federal anti-discrimination law in all 50 states. So many state laws now offer stronger protections than those available under the Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of uh, 1964. However, uh, there is still work to be done and we are going to delve into this topic today. I know there are many more details regarding this issue and what we in Venezuela can learn or take from the, the, these experiences to demand more rights uh, for our own LGBTQ plus community. And with us uh, for this forum is Unión Afirmativa's coordinator, Quiteria Franco, and Sarah Warbelo, who is the legal director for the Human Rights Campaign, which is the most important NGO or movement defending the LGBTQ plus community civil rights in the US. So it's an honor to have you both with us discussing such an important legal breakthrough and as uh, the legal director of such an organization that has not only advanced the rights of the community in the US, but also serves as an example worldwide for countries like ours where LGBT uh, rights are far from fair. Uh, so welcome all and welcome Quiteria Franco to start us off. Thank you, Oscar. No, I'm just gonna uh, say, um... Sarah and Jean, who just joined us, thank you very much for, for giving us your time. And um, I'm, I'm really thrilled to have you here and to learn from uh, you all you have to say about the Bostock position. So thank you very much um, to Human Rights Campaign. Sarah, thank you very much. And uh, let's just listen to, to you. <laughs> thank you. It's wonderful to be here with you today. And um, I'm really appreciate the invitation. I thought I would um, share my screen and just a couple of slides as we talk about the, the Bostock decision um, to, to give you know something to, to look at aside from just me um, as we go through this. And let me go ahead and uh, start the slides. Um, 
So, you know, the Bostock decision is a consolidation of three different cases. Um, Gerald Bostock's uh, case um, that Oscar described for everybody. Um, also a man named Don Zarda, um, who similarly was fired when his employer discovered um, that he was a gay man. Um, he had shared information uh, with one of his clients. He was a skydiving instructor. He was trying to make her feel more comfortable um, being strapped to him by sharing that he was gay. Um, and when that information got to his boss, they decided to terminate him. Um, and then the last is Amy Stevens. Um, Amy Stevens is a transgender woman. Um, uh, she worked for a small funeral home in the state of Michigan. Um, and she shared with her employer that she was going to be transitioning, um, that he had known her um, uh, when she was identifying and presenting as male, um, and that she would be coming into work uh, presenting as female, uh, using the name Amy, um, and setting forward sort of her expectations for how she would be treated in the workplace. Um, her employer uh, essentially said that you know, he couldn't abide uh, her gender identity and terminated her from her employment. So the court um, took all three uh, of these cases at one time um, because they really had similar underpinnings. Um, now, Gerald had lost at the 11th Circuit. So he was in a position um, where his, uh, the, the court system that he was going through essentially said that they didn't think that sexual orientation discrimination is a form of sex discrimination. In contrast, um, uh, Don Zarda's estate, he did unfortunately pass away uh, in the middle of the case, um, and Amy Stevens had both prevailed uh, in their circuits. So they were coming in uh, to the Supreme Court, um, having had good decisions in support of the idea that sexual orientation is covered um, under the law and that gender identity is covered under the law. So the law in question is the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, and when the Civil Rights Act was passed, it included prohibitions um, on employment discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, religion, and sex. But sex was an afterthought. It was really added in the very last moment as part of the legislative process. And as a result, um, there is no definition of sex in the Civil Rights Act, nor was there any discussion about what adding the term sex might mean. Um, typically in the United States, there is uh, ongoing um, debate and uh, consideration for any particular piece of legislation that creates um, a legislative record. Uh, now the courts don't always look to the legislative record, but it is something that can be influential in helping the court to understand what it is that the legislature intended um, when it passed a particular law. Um, and so Congress keeps really robust um, records of all of uh, those public conversations, all of the testimony. Um, so when people come and share uh, what their expectations of what the bill would do were it to become law. So when the courts were looking at this term sex, they're really operating um, in a bit of a vacuum. Um, because it's not clear exactly what Congress intended. Um, and over time, our usage of the term sex has changed quite a bit. It hasn't had sort of a single standard meaning across time and space within the US. So there was a lot of room to really think about um, these particular issues. I do wanna say that in contrast, the Americans with Disabilities Act um, was passed in 1991, very explicitly excludes um, sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, so right in the text of those statutes, um, it says that an individual can't use the Americans with Disabilities Act um, if they're claiming discrimination because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, there are actually some challenges uh, about whether or not it is constitutional to exclude transgender people um, from coverage of the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, but it is a, a different statute. So when the courts began to look at these issues, um, they really thought about this in a couple of different ways. The first was, how do you even talk about sexual orientation or gender identity 
without thinking about sex. The reason that someone would want to fire an individual because they're gay, lesbian, or bisexual, or would want to fire a transgender person is because they don't conform with the expectations of what it means to be quote unquote sufficiently masculine or sufficiently feminine. In the case of um, uh, Bostock and Zarda, as gay men, they didn't meet expectations about how men should behave, um, that they should be dating women. And that's a sex stereotype that most Americans hold, I'd argue probably most people in the world hold um, in terms of norms of behavior. And the Supreme Court had previously determined um, that sex stereotyping itself is a form of sex discrimination. Um, that if you pigeonhole people into particular behaviors based on their sex, it can be disadvantageous to them. Um, it could end up meaning uh, that someone isn't able to get ahead in the workplace or could lead to them receiving different benefits or being fired. Um, the same is true uh, with respect to gender identity in terms of these sex stereotypes, right? It's stereotypes about um, how women should be, how women should behave um, that ended up influencing um, Amy Stevens' boss's decision. In his view, she wasn't woman enough um, because she wasn't assigned female at birth. And it was all of those stereotypes um, that led to these negative outcomes. So the court uh, reiterates and re-emphasizes that sex stereotyping um, is illegal under uh, the Civil Rights Act. And therefore the type of sex stereotyping that happens um, when you stereotype someone based on their sexual orientation or gender identity is also illegal. The second way that the court really looks at this um, is sort of associational discrimination. Um, that it is who you are uh, in a relationship with and your association um, with somebody of the same sex that is leading to that sex discrimination. And so the way that that works is, um, you know, if uh, um, Gerald or Don had been in a relationship with a woman, they would not have been fired. Um, but by changing out the person that they were in association with, um, uh, that they either were in relationships with men or desired to be in relationships with men, um, that, uh, that sex discrimination based on um, who they're in a relationship with. And there's a long body of case law um, around race um, that has found that this is race discrimination, right? So um, if a white person is terminated from their job or someone is unwilling to hire them um, because they have a relationship with someone who is black or brown, that is in fact race discrimination and vice versa. Um, if a, a black or brown person um, is fired or refused, someone refuses to hire them, um, because they're in a relationship uh, with a white person or uh, a black person is in a relationship with a brown person, um, that that is in fact race discrimination that has to be prohibited by civil rights law. Okay. So what does this mean, you know, sort of outside of the employment context? Um, so moving forward, um, it's very clear that you cannot fire someone based on their sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, you can't refuse to hire someone on that basis. You can't harass someone on that basis. Um, but the United States has many laws that prohibit discrimination on the basis of sex. So in addition to employment, um, we have laws that prohibit discrimination in credit. Um, so whether it's providing someone a credit card, um, a loan to purchase a home, um, uh, credit to be able to pursue an education, um, you can't discriminate on the basis of sex. Similarly, we have laws that prohibit discrimination on the basis of sex in housing, education, um, jury selection, and health care. Um, and each of these laws um, is unique. They are not part of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, they are part of other laws, some that were passed around the same time, um, and others like the Affordable Care Act, uh, which were passed you know, in the last decade 
or oh my goodness, I guess 2010, a little more than the past decade, um, but still relatively recent um, compared to uh, the other laws. Now, theoretically, um, the same analysis that was adopted by the Supreme Court in Bostock ought to apply to every single one um, of these other laws. Um, you know, it it's sort of baffling to think that a court would reach a different conclusion um, because none of these uh, laws have exclusions um, for sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, and uh, the, 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 the analysis really does apply across the board. There isn't something unique about employment non-discrimination um, that would lead one to think that um, it would be unacceptable to discriminate um, in employment, but you know, when it comes to housing, it's just fine. However, what we've seen um, is different administrations uh, treat these issues very differently. So the Trump administration, um, literally days after the Bostock decision was issued, finalized a regulation um, for the Affordable Care Act. Um, and during the Obama administration, there was an interpretation of the law um, that provided very concrete protections to transgender people in healthcare um, and alluded to protections for LGB people. Um, uh, not maybe quite as robust of protections as we would have liked, but at least um, there was a start there. And the Trump administration made the decision to completely pull back on those protections um, and went through that regulation, uh, both the preamble to the regulation as well as regulation itself, and scrubbed it of any reference uh, to sexual orientation, gender identity, uh, transgender people. Um, and this is a regulation the transgender people in particular had relied upon to be able to um, receive the health care they needed at federally funded health care institutions, which are the essentially every hospital in the United States. Um, and the vast majority of healthcare clinics receive federal funding. So we're talking about sort of a full scope of care here. Um, and the healthcare protections that they were relying upon included things like um, being free from harassment or being able to hold medical professionals accountable for engaging in harassment. Um, rough uh, behavior. Um, unfortunately, a lot of transgender people, uh, when they, they see a doctor um, who is not supportive of their transition, um, experience rough handling. Um, denial of health care, both transition-related health care, but also health care that has nothing to do um, with a person's transgender status. Um, you know, we heard stories about people going in uh, to the doctor having a broken ankle um, and a doctor refusing to treat them because they are transgender. Um, so this regulation was critically important um, in effectuating change. Now the Trump administration stripped all of that away. Um, uh, the human rights campaign uh, in partnership uh, with uh, a law firm that we worked with were able to secure a nationwide injunction um, to stop the Trump uh, administration regulation from going into effect but it left sort of this vacuum where people were really unsure what would happen depending on the administration. Now, the current administration, the Biden administration, issued an executive order. Um, so this requires all agencies um, at the federal level to one by one go through all of their regulations, all of their guidance, all of their policies, in any place where there are sex non-discrimination protections, update them to make clear um, that discrimination on the basis of gender identity and sexual orientation is also um, illegal and providing um, that robust uh, protection. To date, we've had many agencies, including the Department of Education, the Department of Health and Human Services, and the Department of Labor, um, make clear that they will accept complaints from LGBTQ people who are experiencing discrimination. And it's all based on that interpretation of law coming out of the Supreme Court's Bostock decision. Um, but, you know, regulations take some time. And so there's a lot of ongoing work um, to ensure uh, that those regulations are fully updated 
And we anticipate um, that some of those biggest regulations, uh, the healthcare regulations and the education regulations should be coming out sometime in April. Um, uh, uh, the way that uh, our system operates, uh, there is what's known as a notice and comment period. So um, uh, everybody from experts in the subject matter um, to ordinary Americans have an opportunity to share their thoughts about the changes that are being proposed. And then typically it takes um, you know, six months to a year uh, for that regulation to be fully implemented. So the fact that these agencies are already uh, effectuating the law um, right now, um, prior to those regulations being fully in effect, is critically important um, uh, for providing that recourse when people experience discrimination. Um, so let me go ahead and uh, stop sharing for a moment. Um, since that's the end of, of my uh, slides. But I do want to talk about, you know, sort of what has happened um, uh, in, in this interim period. Um, so we are uh, hearing anecdotally that more people are going to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission um, and bringing charges of sexual orientation and gender identity complaints. Now, um, the Equal uh, uh, Equal uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, EEOC, uh, uh, as its nickname, um, has been, in fact, accepting complaints from LGBTQ folks since 2013. So the agency um, actually has a fair amount of data um, that they have been collecting. And what um, researchers looking at the EEOC data, looking at data from states um, that have uh, uh, actively implemented sexual orientation, gender identity, non discrimination laws have found is that the rates um, of complaints of discrimination for LGBTQ folks are about the same as the rates of discrimination um, that are alleged for race discrimination and for sex discrimination once you control for percentage of the population. Um, so there are uh, obviously a lot fewer LGBTQ folks, or, or at least historically have been fewer um, LGBTQ folks um, than there have been uh, women in the United States um, or racial minorities in the United States. So um, having those controls in place are important. What that tells us is two things. Um, one, um, that discrimination against LGBTQ folks is real, right? Um, that individuals are in fact experiencing this type of discrimination in the workplace. Um, two, it also tells us um, that LGBTQ folks are not necessarily more litigious, more likely to sue than any other um, group of people who experiences discrimination. Um, we have not seen, uh, based on the numbers that have been released publicly, a significant increase um, in complaints. I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One, a lot of Americans still don't know about the Bostock decision. Um, there's a lot of educational work that we have been engaged in, that the EEOC has been engaged in. Um, but there's a lot going on in the world right now. And there has been, you know, since this decision um, happened in June of 2020, right? I mean, so this is happening in the middle of a pandemic. Um, it's harder for people to focus um, and, and get that information that they need. The other reason is that many major employers in the United States had already voluntarily adopted protections from discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. And their general counsels um, and other legal folks are very aware of these decisions and are making sure that their managers know um, that they have an obligation not to discriminate in the first place. And of course, that's always the goal with non-discrimination laws. Um, you want people to have recourse if they do experience that discrimination, but the primary um, purpose of a non-discrimination law is to stop the discrimination from happening in the first place. Um, it, it's not just to create a system in which people can sue left and right. Um, it's to create a system in which people can go to work, uh, to be their full selves at work, and not have to worry um, about being terminated, being harassed, uh, or receiving lesser benefits. When it comes to benefits, this is one of the areas where we're seeing ongoing challenges. Um, we've had a number of courts, uh, um, sort of district court uh, level um, decisions, in which the courts have said, 
we're not sure that the Bostock decision reaches um, employment benefits. So in the US, um, the vast majority of people receive their health care um, uh, benefits or ability uh, to go to the doctor and, and pay either minimal amount of money um, or no money um, through their employer. Um, and so if you can't get health care benefits through your employer, um, you may have uh, no benefits or have benefits um, that are uh, not covering what you need. Um, and so particularly with transition related benefits, right, um, uh, having to not pay um, out of pocket uh, for the ability to have hormone therapy, um, uh, needed surgeries, um, may not be covered uh, by some of these employers. Um, and we believe that both under um, the Bostock decision, as well as the Affordable Care Act, that this is discrimination, but courts haven't necessarily agreed. So this is going to be an ongoing fight and debate. The other area that the Supreme Court really left open um, in terms of its decision um, is what happens um, if an employer has a religious objection uh, to hiring somebody who's LGBTQ. Um, for our religious organizations, the law says that you may limit employment to people of your own faith or prefer people of your own faith. So for example, a Catholic uh, charities could say, you have to be Catholic to work here. And um, most courts would likely interpret that to mean um, you have to be a Catholic in good standing. So it's Catholic charities who gets to define who is and who is not Catholic. Um, but most courts have also said, if you're not gonna hire people of your own faith. So think about a, um, a huge hospital system in the United States, um, run by uh, Catholics or Seventh-day Adventists or a Jewish hospital. Um, if you're going to hire a janitor and you're not going to require that janitor to be of your faith, so um, let's go with a Catholic hospital. A lot of hospitals in the U.S. are Catholic. Um, you couldn't say, well, we'll hire Jewish people, but we won't hire Muslim people. Um, that would still be illegal discrimination if you're not limiting it only to, to Catholics. So the question becomes, are the courts going to allow um, for these religious organizations to require their employees to adhere to the tenets of the faith, right? So you don't literally have to be of the faith, but you have to, um, uh, for example, uh, maybe not drink if the uh, faith says um, that alcohol um, is immoral or um, not eat pork um, if that is against a tenant of the faith. And where this becomes an issue for LGBTQ folks is that many faith traditions um, continue to say uh, that it is a sin uh, to be an LGBTQ person or at least to be in a same-sex relationship or to transition. And so how are the courts going to grapple with this? Are they essentially going to say, um, you know, you don't have to be a Catholic, but you still have to follow Catholic teachings if you want a job there. Um, the other area, um, of course, is for for-profit organizations um, who historically have not been able to avail themselves of a religious exemption are now making arguments in court um, that a statute called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act allows them to not follow um, employment non-discrimination laws if they don't wish to do so. That essentially um, that law uh, is sort of a um, get out of jail free card um, for any statute um, that you object to based on a religious teaching. And in fact, in Amy Stevens' case, Early on, um, her employer said, even if I am bound um, by Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 not to discriminate on the basis of gender identity, I should still get an exception um, based on my religious beliefs. Um, and and you know, said that the Religious Freedom Restoration Act um, should excuse me from complying with the law. Um, now, the Sixth Circuit didn't agree with that assessment but uh, uh, 
the Supreme Court in deciding um, uh, the majority opinion in Vostok um, left this question open. They said, we're not gonna decide it right now. Um, somebody could have a claim. Um, that doesn't mean they'll prevail on their claim, of course, um, but, but you know, we, we will contemplate it as it comes uh, to us um, in the future. So as a result, um, advocates in the U.S. are pushing for uh, a bill, pass, a passage of a bill called the Equality Act. And the Equality Act um, goes in and amends all of the existing um, major sex non-discrimination statutes to add sexual orientation and gender identity so that no future administration can ever say the Bostock decision doesn't really apply with respect to housing. It doesn't really apply um, uh, with respect to credit. Um, it also adds sex, sexual orientation, gender identity to areas of existing federal civil rights law where there's no protection on those bases. Um, most notably are public accommodations laws um, so those are the, the laws that say you can't discriminate against a customer um, uh, or a client, you know, somebody who's coming into a business that is open to the public, as well as all federally funded programs. Currently, there are select federally funded programs where there's sex non-discrimination, um, including education and health care, but also refugee services, but it isn't a blanket non-discrimination for sex, um, and then of course, sexual orientation, gender identity. The only blanket protection right now is for race, color, and national origin. Um, and so the Equality Act would update um, those laws um, and, and make sure um, that people uh, can receive protections in those areas of, of life. Um, it also tries to curtail application of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act um, so that it can't be used as a way to avoid complying with civil rights laws. Um, I will say, you know, given the current makeup of the Supreme Court, um, that may be somewhat irrelevant. Um, uh, the current Supreme Court uh, is show, has shown that it is very inclined um, to interpret uh, the First Amendment, which provides heightened protections um, for religious liberties and religious practices um, to allow it to potentially um, undermine non-discrimination protections uh, in a series of ways. The Supreme Court has agreed to hear a new case um, uh, called 303 Creative, um, which will likely be decided next year um, that opens up the question again of whether or not um, an entity that provides uh, services to the general public um, and where there's a state law that protects um, from discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity, um, whether or not uh, that business has to comply with those particular laws. Um, the Supreme Court, uh, you know, took that up in Masterpiece Cake Shop, um, but really didn't answer the question. Uh, the decision was very narrowly applied um, to that one particular baker. And so this is a request uh, for the Supreme Court to reconsider that particular issue. I think I've thrown a lot at you all, um, but would be happy uh, to engage in some actual discussion and, and questions uh, as we move forward. <laughs> Yeah, that was a great presentation. Um, I learned a whole lot more about the Boston. Uh, I wanted to ask you, Sarah, how has your work changed after this Boston decision in 2020? How has the work of the human rights campaign changed or what has been added to your work after this decision? Yeah. So, you know, we're doing a ton of educational work, trying to get that information out there um, to people that they should, uh, you know, rely upon um, the government entities um, if they experience discrimination, um, trying to educate um, not only employers, but um, uh, school districts and hospitals about their obligations um, post Bostock. Um, we are also um, continuing to work with this administration. Um, you know, it doesn't happen in a vacuum that laws change. There's a lot of priorities. So even when people are well-intentioned, um, you know, it may not be at the forefront of their mind that they need to update these regulations. Um, if we don't have those regulations in place, sometimes people can still sue, but it's not a guarantee. Um, and having those, those regulations in place 
um, also makes it harder, although not impossible, um, for a future administration to pull back on people's rights. And then the last huge thing that we're still doing um, is fighting in the states. Um, we have states that are attacking um, LGBTQ folks, but particularly transgender youth. Um, the Texas governor uh, has um, sent child protective services after parents who are supporting their, their trans um, children by allowing them to receive um, medically appropriate and age appropriate um, uh, gender affirming care. Um, the state of Florida, the governor is likely to sign uh, into law a bill that would make it impossible for teachers from kindergarten to third grade um, to discuss sexual orientation or gender identity um, and make it hard for, for teachers and um, other grades to do so. Um, and then we just have state after state that's um, restricting trans youth's ability, particularly trans girls, to play on girls sports teams, um, making it illegal to provide transition related care for doctors um, to youth. Uh, you know, uh, we have Alabama that is considering making it a felony. Um, so people's lives are going to be destroyed. Um, if the states continue on this path. And we are trying to battle that with all the tools in our toolbox, um, getting corporations uh, to weigh in, weighing in directly ourselves, doing the education, um, and then of course, preparing to sue um, uh, some of these states uh, if these, these bills uh, do in fact become law. Sarah, thank, thank you very well. much. Uh, thank you very much for everything. You, you threw in so much information. And I had so many questions, most of which you answered in your presentation. Uh, but what, what I get from um, uh, what you said is that this is an everyday job, taking care of the rights we have gained, because at any time, there's going to be somebody trying to challenge them. So we cannot take for granted all the rights that we have achieved. Um, but what, what um, makes me also um, see is that uh, feel somehow envy of, of some countries like the United States where uh, uh, the law actually works, that people can actually go and file a complaint and know that they will have an answer, mm -hmm. uh, which, which is not the case in, in Venezuela. We, we have had um, several cases of people being fired from their job because of their sexual orientation. And the excuse we get from authorities is that because we don't have a law um, against discrimination, uh, as United Nations recommends, there is no way uh, for them to know how to act. So, um, it's somehow good to know that that it works for you. Even if people don't know yet of the bust of position, uh, it's there. It's just a matter of telling them this is this exists and we're working for you and we have you have a, a way of um, demanding a justice. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I have some questions. Um, How is the process of uh, um, of the Equality Act going? Uh, because that will solve what you said. You know, the change of administration for put it in risk um, uh, non discrimination. So the solution at some point would be approving the Equality Act. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us how that process is going? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, the bill has passed the House of Representatives twice now. Um, so uh, we have two year legislative sessions. Um, after that two years is up, um, each body would have to pass, uh, both the House and the Senate have to pass the bill in order for it to become law. Um, so the House has done that twice now um, in the last legislative session and then in the current legislative session. The current legislative session um, runs through uh, January uh, of next year. Um, and uh, the Senate had a hearing um, on the bill, but did not uh, actually vote on the bill. Um, we are in conversations with senators um, pushing uh, to have those discussions, uh, particularly with Republicans. Um, the current makeup of the Senate 
um, is 50 Democrats and, and 50 Republicans, um, with the vice president, um, who is a Democrat, being uh, the tiebreaker. Unfortunately, in the Senate, to get any business done, um, with the exception of judicial nominations, you have to have 60 votes. Um, 50 is not enough. And that's something that um, most Americans, in fact, are not aware of. Um, people think about it as just having a majority of the votes and that's the end of it. And that is how it operates in the House, but not the Senate. And because of this filibuster process, um, we really do have to have Republicans who are willing to vote um, in support of the bill. I'll also say we think it's a good idea to have Republicans vote um, in support of the bill. It means that it's less likely to come under attack if at some point Republicans, um, again, have the majority of the Senate, um, that they'll just not be as inclined to want to revisit and, and try to muck with or meddle uh, with the law. Um, uh, we are sort of doing an all out uh, push uh, to get this uh, bill to the president's desk. Um, you know, he is more than willing to sign it. I would say eager to sign it, um, but it is an uphill battle. Um, uh, you know, uh, open up any US uh, newspaper and you can see that we just have a lot of gridlock in Congress right now. Um, people are uh, more polarized in the United States based on political party. Um, than uh, you know, we've had in generations. Um, and that's just making it very hard, um, frankly, for our democracy to thrive. Um, you know, we have good solid institutions in place, um, but, but democracy is always fragile. Indeed, democracy is always fragile. We uh, experience it every day here in Venezuela. And I want to pass it over to Quiteria for a question, because I want to know, we, we, we have some, some guests here also from the Human Rights Campaign, uh, and I'm sure they would like to know what framework or what uh, platforms do we have in Venezuela uh, for protecting LGBTQ plus rights. I know there are some uh, regional ordinances that can be mentioned. And what can we learn in Venezuela from the experience of uh, the, this uh, Bostock decision and the experience of the US? Thank you, Oscar. Well, um, in Venezuela, what we have is basically um, mentions in some laws and even in the constitution of prohibition of discrimination. That's what we have. Um, in the constitution, for example, we have article 21 that prohibits discrimination in uh, based on sex, um, uh, race, uh, origin. It does not mention social, uh, sexual orientation, but it was solved in, um, in a decision of 2008. That was a case that we introduced to the Supreme Court in Venezuela. And it said that it's uh, prohibited to discriminate, um, uh, to discriminate a person based on the sexual orientation. Uh, there was a huge um, decision that we had, not, not as much as we wanted it or we expected it because it was also looking for the approval of um, marriage, uh, equal marriage back then, it did not happen. And then we also have some laws uh, that includes the law um, workers law that prohibits discrimination based on uh, the sexual orientation, but we don't have rules or regulations that tell uh, public employees how to process um, complaints on discrimination. Um, um, we don't have a law uh um against discrimination so that's something that we need uh in venezuela um so basically we have all these prohibitions of discrimination but not um instructions or guidance on how to uh present complaints which is basically we have nothing you know <laughs> that's what i say we have nothing there is no protection uh, a real and effective protect protection against discrimination. Um, but what I would like to know, I'm, I'm sorry, I have another question for Sarah, <laughs> is that um, this, this Bostock decision, did, oh, first of all, why is it called the Bostock decision if the other two cases involved? Mm -hmm. And to file this complaint, do they start it um, the, the complaint by themselves, they got help from an organization 
uh, how is the process to file a complaint based on discrimination? Because I, I would like to understand that since we don't have it in Venezuela. Thank yeah. you, Sarah. Well, and, and fortunately, the Bostec decision is a fascinating example of the different ways that you can um, uh, file a complaint in the U.S. And, and so, you know, I will say um, it's not uncommon for the U.S. Supreme Court to consolidate cases. So take two or more cases that have a similar set of facts, similar issues that are being raised and pushing them together uh, uh, and then hearing, uh, you know, arguments from, from those parties. Um, I think it was just um, happenstance that the Bostock uh, ended up being the, the name of the case. Um, our marriage equality decision, Obergefell, was also another one of those consolidated cases, and um, it really could have it could have been um, uh, the Love case. Actually, there was a plaintiff whose last name was Love, um, but it, we ended up with Obergefell, so <laughs> a little bit random in how the court uh, decides those things. Um, but in terms of filing a complaint. Um, you know, uh, you always in an employment situation have to go to the EEOC and file a complaint there, but you don't have to wait for the EEOC to act. Um, you can request what's known as a right to sue letter, and then you can um, uh, represent yourself in court. You can work with an organization that helps uh, folks out, or um, you can hire a private attorney. So Gerald Bostock, hired a private attorney um, to help him uh, win his case. Um, Don Zarda um, went to uh, a, another national um, US LGBTQ organization, Lambda Legal, um, and they were helping him. Ultimately, the ACLU um, supported his case, but, but initially he had gone to Lambda Legal. Um, and then in Amy Stevens' case, um, when she filed her complaint with the EEOC, the commissioners of the EEOC said, wow, we're really stunned about what happened to her. We're really concerned. And we believe that she should win. So the EEOC actually sued on her behalf. So the agency went to court um, to make an example of her case. Um, they really wanted to make sure um, that it was in fact decided uh, for the entirety of the United States um, that you can't discriminate in employment on somebody based on somebody's gender identity. Um, so you've got three in this one case, you've got three very different ways that people are being um, uh, represented. Um, I would say the most common in the United States uh, is for people um, to hire a private attorney if the negotiation process with the EEOC doesn't work out. Um, or they don't want to wait to see um, if their employer will uh, uh, work with the EEOC to come to some sort of resolution. The majority of employment cases never seek the court. Um, they get worked out uh, with the help of the EEOC um, and, and people just make private you know, decisions. Um, Thank you, sir. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much for those answers. Are there any more questions from um, Dean? People? Dean has Dean has uh, her hand raised. Yeah, her this hand is a conversation, is... so we we all, you know, we have uh, we can just jump in. Mm -hmm. Yes, hi. Welcome, Dean. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm Jean. I'm she. Her pronouns. I'm with the Human Rights Campaign, and very privileged to be a colleague of Sarah, and so thrilled that you invited us here to share today. I mean, whenever I hear Sarah speak, it's like I'm going to this incredible lecture on, you know, LGBTQ plus law, and I learn so much. Thank you, Sarah. I mean, it's always wonderful for me um, to listen to you. And um, yes, I do encourage any of the other uh, colleagues on the on the uh, call to ask questions. Um, I'm with our global program. But I do have a question for you, Sarah, which is the way you lay this out, you talk about this incredible interplay between the courts, the legislature, and the regulatory mechanisms that we have. And the question that I always have is, you know, from a strategy point of view, if you, you know, an activist in advocate in Guad in Venezuela, right? It's like, how do you decide where to put the resources that you have? We at HRC in the US, we're fortunate, we have a lot of resources. And so we're actually able to, to play the courts, you know, the impact litigation, 
the po political work that we do with the US Congress and our work at the regulatory level. But what, what are some of the factors that you want to take into account when really trying to figure out what is your strategy? And the example, of course, I think of is like right now, where our courts are going in the wrong direction in the United States. They're being stacked against us. And in fact, bringing court cases to the courts might end up in rulings that we really don't want. So anyway, so how do you sort of make these kinds of decisions? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So we really do weigh um, where we think we can get the most friendly decision. Um, you know, can Congress act quickly? Will it act quickly? Um, and sometimes on some little issues, it does. Um, uh, Congress just reauthorized the Violence Against Women Act as part of a bigger package um, last week, uh, which expanded um, resources for LGBTQ folks who are the victims um, of uh, domestic violence. Um, so there sometimes are real opportunities, even if we can't get done everything we wanna get done um, uh, through Congress. Right now, we have a president who is willing to be supportive of the LGBTQ um, uh, community. And so we're taking advantage of working um, to implement the Bostock decision. You know, if uh, uh, Trump were still in office, um, we would have made very different decisions in terms of um, the amount of uh, resources that we put into the administrative work. Um, it would have been defensive. It's not that we wouldn't have put any in, um, but right, it, we wouldn't have been on the offense. And with the courts, um, you know, the makeup of the courts absolutely determines how we look at things. It influences where, if we're going to bring a court case, um, are we bringing a court case where it's going to go up through, uh, you know, the Fourth Circuit or the Fifth Circuit? Those are two very different courts. Um, one is fairly progressive. One is probably the most conservative court in the country, and so that you know influences where we bring um, litigation. We do have a, a very unfriendly um, Supreme Court, although not so unfriendly that we didn't get the Bostock decision, um, right? I mean, uh, Justice Gorsuch is extraordinarily conservative justice um, and still you know, was able to look at the statute and say, um, you know, we have to get to a, or we, the only obvious conclusion here is that this is sex discrimination because that's what the statute effectively tells us. Um, you can't interpret sex without touching on sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, but we also don't want certain laws to stand. Um, uh, for example, when the ACLU challenged Arkansas's law um, that makes it uh, illegal to provide transition related care uh, that is age and medically appropriate to youth, um, they sued because if they let that stand, you will have more states that will engage in copycat measures. So not the friendliest court, although they got an excellent decision. Um, uh, but if they hadn't, you know, I think we would have seen five or six states now um, have bans on gender affirming care uh, rather than um, the one that has the statutory uh, ban, which they can't even effectuate right now. Wonderful, thank you so much for these answers. Now I'll pass it over to Kiteria again for the concluding remarks, uh, seeing that we're reaching uh, the hour. And, and if there are any other questions, maybe uh, it's, it's the time to ask them <laughs> after Kiteria's uh, closing remarks. No, I, I just want to know if there are more questions before <laughs> I start closing because we, we don't want to take more time of uh, Sarah. It's been wonderful, Sarah. Uh, uh, everything you've, you've said to us and this and that bit. Thank you, Jean, for the question because that's basically what, what we're trying to look for. Uh, how to uh, somehow do in Venezuela, uh, follow you as an example, how to uh, advocate and how to um, work with the government. Um, we unfortunately have a government that does not answer our demands, our requests. So it's very frustrating. So probably it, it, it could be a change of a strategy. So what you just said is it's really helpful for us. But if there is, I don't know if Samuel has a question. I see he's, he's uh, there, like he wants to ask a question, Samuel. No, <laughs> all right. Anyone else, no? No, all right. Thank you, Sarah. Um, 
you have answered all of the questions I had. I didn't even have to ask them <laughs> because you gave us all this wonderful information. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, uh, Jean, for your all, for your help, and um, hope we we can have uh, another chance to repeat these wonderful sessions. These conversations are very useful for us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you much all. For Gracias you. por estar aquí, por eh, eh, estar en esta llamada Zoom y este, los invito a que lo compartan y lo analicen para eh, ver cómo podemos lograr un cambio en Venezuela hacia los derechos LGTBIQ+, en Venezuela. Hasta mm -hmm. luego y hasta una próxima oportunidad. Gracias, sí. señora afirmativa. Gracias, Stop VIH. Gracias, uh, The Human Rights Campaign. Y será hasta una próxima oportunidad que tengamos otra de estas conversaciones vía Zoom aquí. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs>